الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. إن شاء الله brothers um, and sisters that are listening, uh, we're going to today go through the history of bid'ah, the history of innovation. As you all know, bid'ah is the thing that is in direct opposition to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم سنة. The greatest thing a person can do is shirk, which is to worship someone besides Allah. Then after shirk, the thing that comes second in line is bid'ah, because bid'ah opposes the sunnah. So shirk goes against la ilaha illallah, that there is none worthy to be worshipped in truth except for Allah alone. And bid'ah goes against Muhammad Rasulullah. We're told to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in terms of his speech, his statement, sorry, in terms of his statements, his actions and his belief. These are the three things that we're told to follow. And bid'ah is any belief that goes against his belief. It's any statement that goes against his statement. And it's any action that goes against his action, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In this, you're also going to learn the history of how the ummah divided. We all know about the glory of Islam and how Islam used to be strong and you know there was you know the, how, how vast the empire of, of the Muslims stretched. We're going to learn at which point the Islamic Empire peaked and what was the reason for its glory days and at what point did the Islamic power in terms of governance and military when it started to decline when it started to divide today we always talk about uniting the Muslims I agree I'm with that I want to unite the Muslims too but on what first we have to understand what was it that caused them to divide because you will see that it was bid'ah that caused the Muslims to divide. And people are trying to cause the Muslims to unite by ignoring the bid'ah. And that doesn't make any sense. It's like trying to cure a person's cancer by neglecting the very cancer in the first place. So without any further ado, inshallah ta'ala, we start at the time of the Sahaba. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, when he left this world, he left his companions upon guidance. And he left them upon unity. In fact, the Monday morning in which the Prophet ﷺ died and the angel of death took his soul. At the, at the earliest part of the day, when he came and he saw the Muslims were praying Fajr prayer and Abu Bakr anhu was leading them because he was too sick to actually lead the prayer himself. So as he was in his house which was connected to the masjid, he looked through the curtain and noticed that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was leading the Muslims in Salah and the Muslims were united in the Salah behind him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he smiled. And that was the last thing he saw from this Ummah. He saw them united upon two things. Worshipping Allah alone in the prayer and in following his Sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He smiled as if to say, Alhamdulillah, I've, 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 I've done my mission. I've done what I needed to do. And then hours later, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he died. He passed away alayhi salatu wasalam. So when the Sahaba were left in this way, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa knew them, they were united, they were strong. So much so that no one could speak. No, no one could spread bid'ah at the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an. There used to be a man called Sabih ibn Islim. Sabih ibn Islim was from Iraq. And he tried to start he tried to open doubts on some verses of the Qur'an. Allah said, He would go to the people and say, What's this? He's trying to make people confused about the verses of the Qur'an and the meanings of the verses in the Qur'an. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Ali Imran, the people who take the verses that are ambiguous and they try to use them over the verses that are clear. You see, sometimes a verse might have many meanings, and sometimes a verse has a clear-cut meaning. It cannot have more than one meaning. How do you understand the one that has many meanings? You understand it in accordance to the one that's clear. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, نَحْنُ نَحْنُ He said we. So we can mean two things. It can either mean we as in the plural, me and a few people, or it could mean we as in the royal individual, the royal singular. So 
in the in the Arabic language, if a king said we, he doesn't mean more than himself. He means just him. But we can also mean me and a few other people. So when Allah says we, that could mean one of two, right? It could mean it could mean a couple things. So which one does it mean? The Christians came and they said, Oh look, see, it says Trinity in the Quran. Because Aqal Ujjam Thalath. The minimum that a a plural can be is three. So there you go, Trinity. And Allah said Allah said we. So that's Trinity in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said down this verse saying that in the Quran there are verses that are clear. Clear cut verses. And then there are those that are ambiguous. They need a bit more explanation. The ones that are clear, he said, Hunna Ummul Kitab. They are the mother of the book. Why did he say mother? Because the mother is the thing that all the children go around. So that's why these verses were called the mother of the book because all the other verses that might not be so clear, they revolve around these clear cut verses. So the people who have diseases in their heart and say, Nahnu, which is we, means more than one, so there's more than one Allah, are people with sicknesses in their heart because why do they not go to the clear cut verses? For example, Allah said, Ilahukum ilahu wahid. Your deity, your God that you worship is one. In another part, Allah said, Qulhu Allahu ahad. Say, He is Allah, one and only. So they ignored all of these clear cut verses that, you know, so now that you know Allah is in this place is clearly and categorically and emphatically and unswervingly said, I am one. So then now when he says Nahnu, you know that this doesn't mean him and someone else, it means the royal, individual, singular, right? That's how you do it. So this man was trying to do that. He was trying to basically, he was using Adhariyati Tarawa. What does this mean? He's trying to play with the people's minds in terms of what it means. When Umar ibn Khattab when he heard this, when he heard this, he became angry. He ordered for the man to be brought to him. And he ordered for him to be tied to a horse from Iraq and dragged. He ordered for him to be tied to a horse from Iraq and dragged. All the way to Medina. And why was he given this punishment and humiliation? Because he was trying to divide the ranks of the Muslims with his corrupted views and beliefs and ideologies. Nowadays we cry, right? Because there are people walking around with corruptive beliefs and ideologies. These corruptive beliefs and ideologies turn people into what? Into savages, into killers. The Salaf, they used to say, the people of Bid'ah, they always open the sword on people. They always open the sword on people. So look at these people like ISIS and so on and so forth. They, they're very quick to spill the blood of people. Even when you go to a masjid, there might be some Berelvis or whatever have you, and you start to explain to them, okay, this is shirk, this is Bid'ah. They get very angry, they want to hurt you. They want to hit you, so I'm going to slap you in the face. The people of Bid'ah are very quick to become aggressive. So because Umar ibn Khattab, he, he understood the danger that could come from this. He ordered him to be dragged, attached to a horse, literally dragged all the way from Iraq, all the way to Medina. When he came, Umar radiallahu an, he struck him on the head hard one time, smacked him hard. And the man felt so much pain. He said, if you're going to kill me, don't give me a slow death, just kill me. Give me qatr and janila, give me a good death, just, just end me quickly, because this is too painful. But he said, if you're not going to kill me, then I fixed up. In other words, wherever it was wrong in the guy's head, Umar hit the right place. And he corrected his situation. Whatever's wrong, it was fixed now. And then Umar radiallahu an, he ordered for no one to speak to this man for one year. So he got the physical <coughs> punishment and he got the psychological punishment. He was, he was not allowed, no one was allowed to speak to him for an entire year. And this was what it was like at Umar's time. No one could get away with spreading corrupted beliefs and ideologies. No one could get away and say things that would cause tension and conflict and, and pain and suffering to the Muslims. Right? He was taking control of the situation. And from him in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, the Muslims they began to conquer and they began to spread. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them power and might to the point where the Muslims had conquered from the footsteps in China to the east to the shores of Spain and the west. And the peak of the Muslim expansion was in the year 93 after Hijrah. So remember our calendar works after the Prophet ﷺ moved to Medina after he done Hijrah. So 93 years after the Prophet ﷺ moved to uh, Medina, the Muslims had reached their peak, their climax in terms of actual ground that they cover and, and whatnot. And they were united. One Khalifa, one leader, one leader who was leading the Muslims from the footsteps of China in the east to shores of Spain and the west. So I'm going to give you an example, four examples, to show you just how far this conquest went. You have the story of the great warrior Uqbat ibn Nafi' 
Uqbat ibn Nafi' rahimahullah, who was a great warrior. And when he he was he, he, he was leading the Muslim army in the west. So from, from, from Medina towards the west side, which is Morocco and that kind of region. So when you keep going west towards North Africa, eventually you reach Mauritania, which is just under Morocco. So when he got to Mauritania, so if you imagine the map, this is, this is Africa, and he's gone all the way across. Now, he's conquered everything. Everything's everything been conquered. Egypt, all that, you know, Tunisia, Libya, Algeria, Moroccan, all that region's conquered. What's left here now, he's gone down to Mauritania. When he reached the shore where the sea is, he's like, I can't go any further. I've run out of land. So he took his horse and he charged into the sea. And when he charged into the sea, he went as far as he could until the water reached his horse's head. And when he could physically not go any further, he raised his hands to the sky. And he said, Allah, bear witness that I've done my best for you. If it wasn't for this land of sea, I would have gone forward and conquered as far towards the west as I possibly could have. But because the sea has stopped me, otherwise I would have carried on until no one is worshipped except for you, Ya Allah, until shirk and all of that is eradicated. So the people, they said... Had they not been sea, he would have conquered America. The only thing that stopped him from conquering America, or the Americas, I should say, was the fact that there was ocean. Because at that time, they wouldn't have been able to resist because the Muslims were a military power. Then you have the example of Qutaybat ibn Muslim al-Bahili in the east. He conquered and took his army towards the boundary of China in the east. Now he couldn't invade China. The reason he couldn't is because China had a peace treaty. China had a peace treaty with the Muslims. Now we know that the Muslims are not allowed to go against their treaties, right? When you're in a state of, of peace, then a person cannot go in and conquer, right? That's why it always bewilders me when there's people that support acts of terrorism and crime in this country. And they say, oh, look, England has military presence in Muslim countries so because of that and they're fighting and they're killing people in Muslim countries which is terrible it's wrong it's oppressive and we hate that and we're against that but they say oh because they do that we are now allowed to what we're allowed to kill innocent people here why because we're in a state of war they say this is Darul Harb makes no sense because we're not in a state of war here the fact that you live in this country you have agreed to a state of peace your, your passport and your residency here, what this means, so we're going to stay in a state of, of, of peace. You're, we're, we're, you're not going to have trouble and facade and fitna from us. Okay? Like, for example, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah went against the Prophet. The Prophet in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah had to hand Muslims over to the Kfar in order for this peace treaty to remain. It's a very long story. But to summarize, <coughs> some of these people who look at you and say, Akhi, what do you mean? How can you spill innocent blood? This is not a state of war. We're, in a, we're not, we're, 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 we've got a coven of, of peace. We, we're not living in a state of war. We don't have guns flying around. And no, no, no one's scared. But you, you agree to this. You live here, right? If you want, if you really are that, you know, concerned and you want to fight, go, give your passport in. Give your residency in. Give it all in. Because then you said, look, I retract my covenant with you. I retract my treaty with you. I've got, I've, I, I'm, not, I'm not in a state of peace with you no more. And you go back home. And then you can do whatever you want if, you really, if, it, if it really is. Not that I'm saying you should go and kill innocent people anywhere. No. But the point is that if you had that mindset and that thinking, then at least don't be a traitor. Because when you walk in the streets, people don't expect you to blow them up. People don't expect you to just drive a car and run them over. When you walk in the streets, people expect they're going to drive on the road. They expect that there's going to be safety. The fact that you run them over or you do something crazy, it means you violated the state of peace. You violated the state of peace. These same people that would look at you as a sellout if you said that, wallahi if they saw the Prophet they would insult the Prophet the same way. Because the Prophet handed over Abu Jandal to, 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 to the Kuffar of Mecca because of the peace treaty. And Abu Basir radiallahu anhu came to the Prophet running from Mecca, escaping to Medina. And part of the peace treaty was that Muslims would not be able to leave Mecca and join him in Medina anymore. They would not be able to do that. And he said, I can't do anything for you, Abu Basir. He said, I can't be a traitor. I can't be a traitor. I can't do that. We agreed to a peace treaty. It was always the Kuffar who broke the treaty. The Muslims, they never done that. So, 
these these Muslims had a peace. These Chinese kuffar, these disbelievers from China, had a peace treaty with the Muslims because they didn't want the Muslims to enter into China because they knew they wouldn't be able to do it. So the Muslims signed a peace treaty, and now this man Qutayba ibn Muslim al Bahili, rahimullah, he's confused at the border. He's like, I can't step in, but there was a problem because he took an oath. He took a vow, he took a qasm, he swore by Allah. He said, I swear by Allah, I'm going to go into China. And when I go into China, I'm going to wipe my head over 300 kings and princes of China. Meaning I'm going to humiliate them, as in I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be in charge of them. The kings and the princes of China, they're going to come to me. And in their own country where they used to govern, I'm going to overcome them and I'm going to wipe my, like a child. You know when you, when you see a child and you wipe your head over the child's head? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. But he's saying, I took, a, I took an oath. I swore by Allah. So I'm gonna, I have to fill my oath. Otherwise, I'm going to break it. So, but I can't at the same time break this covenant of peace. So what do I do? So they, you know what they did? They brought him a container of earth from China. So that he could stand on top of it. So there was earth from China. So it's like he's standing on top of China. And what did they do? They went into China. And they brought him 300 kings and princes from China. They brought him 300 kings and princes from China. Why? So that a Muslim soldier, a Muslim general, a Muslim warrior, can wipe his head over their heads. And wallahi, he did. He stood on the, on the mound of earth. And these 300 kings and princes came and literally just tapped their head like they were children. <laughs> so his oath could be fulfilled. Why am I telling you this? So you could see the honor of Islam. That the Chinese kings and princes was told you have to leave your palace. And China is a big country. They're coming from different parts of the country. All coming. Why? Just so a Muslim could just touch their head. And they did it. And they did it. Allah. Because that was the honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given to the Muslims. And look at that. He didn't have to break the treaty and become a traitor. Go in and kill innocent people in order for Allah to honor him. Rather he was patient upon the, the treaty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him. The same way the Prophet was patient upon the treaty of Hudaybiyah. And what did Allah do? Through that very treaty that looked like it was against the Muslims, and him being patient on that treaty, Allah gave him Mecca in the end. When the time when they signed the treaty, Allah said, Inna fatahna laka fatahum mubina. It's verily, this is a clear cut victory for you, a clear cut conquest. And the people, Sahaba, were confused. How is they, you might be thinking, how is this a victory? We have to hand Muslims over. They wanted to come from we can't go to Umar, we can't fight, we can't do nothing. We have to make peace and not only are we making peace, we have to hand our Muslims back. How is the victory? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the victory. It's your job and my job to obey him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we have the example of the Muslim army expanding north. North when I say, I mean up to Europe. So the Muslims conquered Spain. They went high, high as high as they could. They went to Italy. Muslims conquered parts of Greece. They conquered parts of Sicily and southern Italy. Hatta Muslims conquered parts of France. There is a battle that took place, and I think they call it the Battle of the Martyrs. And it's also called the Battle of Torres. Torres is the place in France where the battle took place. That place, Torres, is 70 miles from Paris. And Paris is maybe about 350 miles from where we're from, from London. From London, it's about 350 miles. Maybe even less than that. It's not very far. And that battle, the Battle of Torres, was 70 kilometers from Paris. To show you, it wasn't far from England. It wasn't far. The Muslims went that high up. It wasn't far at all. And the Muslims were overcoming the French. They were beating them. They were defeating them. But in the end, the Muslims lost. And the scholars explained the reason they lost is because something similar happened like what happened in the Battle of Uhud. In the Battle of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ told the, some of the Sahaba to stay in a particular area, told them not to move. And those Sahaba were supposed to guard a particular strategic point to prevent the enemy from coming around the back. But they moved, and the story is a bit long, and the reason for the, which they moved, which was wrong, they disobeyed the Prophet in that regard. Um, and then the Khalid ibn Walid, who was not a Muslim at the time, he brought his army from the back, and he attacked the Muslims from the back. And what did he do? He ended up sandwiching the Muslims. They had, the, they had one set of army from the front and one from the back, the Muslims were in the middle, and then the Muslims lost. And the battle of Torres was similar to that. They were winning, they were winning, they were winning. Something went wrong. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He took it away from them. But look at something. This is from Western historical sources. They mention that this battle, the battle of Torres, was such a determining battle 
that all of the kings of Europe united together to fight the Muslims in this battle. It was such a big battle. And they mentioned themselves, the Western historians, the European historians, that had the Muslims won that battle, they would have conquered the whole of the Europe. England would have been a Muslim country today. Allah didn't will it to be. But why am I mentioning this to you? To show you how far and how great the Muslim army went. And then down south. And it's not south for us, but I'm talking about south in context of the Arabian Peninsula. South you have India, the region which is now Pakistan and Bangladesh. And the Muslims conquered that as well. And we all know that history very well. So this was Islam in its, in its peak. Pay attention. This was when the Sunnah was strong. And Bid'ah was not rampant. The people of Bid'ah, if they existed, they existed in crooks and crannies. They would have to hide undercover, whisper in secret corners and gatherings. They wouldn't be able to speak. But when Bid'ah came, the divide within the Muslim Ummah began to grow. The first group that came out was the Khawarij. And they're the most dangerous or one of the most dangerous sects. And they are the grandfathers of the likes of ISIS and so on and so forth. Why? Because not only do they divide the Muslims, they kill the Muslims. People don't know. ISIS and the likes killed more Muslims than they killed disbelievers. They killed Mus Muslims way more than they killed disbelievers. And so did these people. They killed Uthman. They, tried, they killed Ali. They fought against Ali. Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma to him and Uthman. And when they did that, they split the Muslim uh, the Muslim Ummah. And then the Khawarij, who were trying to make the Muslims Kuffar, when they came, another group came out, which was another extreme, because extremism breeds extremism. They took the other side. Because the Khawarij was saying, everyone's a Kafir, 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 so we have to kill him. The Murja came and said, well, basically, I'm dumbing it down. But in other words, what they said was, no one's a Kafir. Even the guy who does Kufr, we're going to still say he's a Muslim. So they came with the other extreme. So now they further divided the Muslims. Because remember, before we were, we were united upon Quran, Sunnah. Now, there's a group there that's talking and they have their own view. There's a group there that's talking and they have their own view. Suddenly, there's dissension in the camps. Suddenly, there's confusion in the ranks. Suddenly, there's disruption amongst the masses. And then, the Jahmiyyah came out, which is another group. And the divide, it widened. And then the Shia came out. And the divide, it widened. Then the Mu'tazila came out and the divide it grew further. Then Madrasatul Ahlu Ra'i in Iraq it came out. The people who gave precedence to the intellect over the text and the divide it widened. And then came the uh, Asha'ira, which is a group that came from the Jahmiya. Then came the Kullabiya, which is a type of uh, Murja and similar to the Asha'ira. The Qiramata, East. East of Saudi Arabia, 200 years they came and they and, and they and they had a government. Now, now remember these these little groups, the bid'ah little groups. They started to make their own little armies. They started to make their own states. They started to fight against the Muslims. They, now we wonder why the different you know countries. Of course, these modern day lines that were drawn were drawn by imperialists from Europe that once colonized. But this concept of Muslims being divided and not being one set unit, it came because of this bid'ah. People don't realize it wasn't. Political differences, it was religious differences. To say that the difference between us and the Shia is a political difference, wallahi, it's a, it's a lie. It's not a political difference. It's a theological difference. They have a different religion to us. They do not believe what we believe. The Salaf will say, Akfaru min Yehud wa Nasara. Their disbelief and their kufr is more, is more severe. It's more, it's, they, 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 they are greater disbelievers than the Jews and the Christians. That's what the Salaf would say. Their religion is different. They don't even believe the Quran. This is our Quran. They believe it's been changed. They believe, they say that there is another Quran. The Mus'haf of Fatima radiallahu anha. And they say our Quran that we have today, not even one word, not even one word which is in the Mus'haf of Fatima is in our Quran. So we say not even la ilaha illallah. Not even la ilaha illallah is in it. SubhanAllah. It's a totally different religion. It's a totally different religion. So when they came, they made armies, they made governments, they, they divided. This is what divided the Ummah. The Khawarij, they came, they divided the Ummah. It was Bid'ah. And now you have people today saying, 
if this this guy who's a Shi'i, who's from the Shia, this guy who's a Sufi, he's a Jah, I'm gonna work with them. What they don't realize? Why? I'm gonna unite with them. They don't realize these were the guys who created the divide in the first place. So, like I said, can you treat a cancer patient by ignoring the cancer? So, can you treat the division in the Ummah by ignoring the cause of the division, which is bid'ah? It's literally like throwing dirt under the rug. It will stink. The stench will grow. It will still stink, right? It will rot. It will corrupt. Rats will come if you leave it. And then you have the Dawla Samariya, which was in Khurasan, Iran, Afghanistan. And again, there were a group of the Shia. The Dawla Buwayhiya, in the west of the Muslim world. The Khawarij, they over time established different states, different sects. What does it show, brothers and sisters? What it shows is that whenever innovation appears, it causes disunity. Whenever a new bid'ah is introduced, this is why we're so harsh against bid'ah. Because every it were, in our mind we're saying, the Ummah is already divided. Every time you add a bid'ah, whether small, whether big, it makes no difference. You've just deepened, widened the crack. You further the divide. And that is how the Muslims divided and they became what it is today. That's why one, not, not, one, two, not, not two Muslims from different parts of the world can get, to get, get along together. They can't get along together because they've been corrupted with these different views and ideologies. Some of them are Shi'i, some of them are Sufi, some of them are Khwani, some of them are Tabliki, some of them are, some of them are that way. You can't get along. Why? Because your, your understanding of the religion is in direct opposition to the other. But what I do want to do is I want to mention to you an example of unity in our recent history. When I say recent, I mean the last 250 odd years. An example of unity in recent times. I want to mention to you the example of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab is an interesting uh, figure in history. Someone who's been hugely misrepresented by those who are the enemies of Islam. Primarily, the people of Bid'ah, when I say Islam, I mean the true understanding of Islam. Because they are still Muslims, many of them, even though they are upon Bid'ah. Uh, and some of them, their Bid'ah reached Kufr. So they left the fold of Islam regardless. But the point is that people who hate the true understanding of Islam, they start to spread lies about him. And what happened? They fed the Kufar these lies, and the Kufar also now spread propaganda about Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. But where did they get it from? They got it from the people of Bid'ah. And it's interesting, the scholars, they always say that the ones who backstab the Muslims and open the door for the Muslims to be attacked by the disbelievers was always the people of Bid'ah. For example, when the Mongols came to attack the Muslims in Iraq, who was it that backstabbed the Muslims and allowed the Mongols to come? It was the Shia who were there. When Salahuddin al-Ayubi, rahimahullah, was fighting against the Crusaders, in fact, before Salahuddin Nuruddin Zinki, rahimullah, who was his, who was his mentor, who was his predecessor, when he was fighting, what was the biggest problem that he faced? Does anyone know? Was it the Shia? The Shia. There was a group called the Hashashin. They used to smoke hashish, get high, and they used to go kill people. They used to c conduct assassinations. So the word assassin comes from the assassins comes from the word hashashin. So these hashashin were you know you talk about Assassin's Creed. That's, that's the Shia creed. <laughs> that's where it come from. The first assassins were Shia. And every time they saw the Muslims conquering uh, uh, land and, and, and regaining land against the Crusaders, they would come and kill the Muslims who were in control. They quickly just come in the shadows, stab. And I was like, who killed him? How did he die? Where did he go from? So that's why Salahuddin Ayyubi, when he came into power, the first thing he did was he fought the Shia. He got rid of these hashashin. He said, he said, how am I going to fight the kuffar? There's, how am I going to fight these crusaders? There's no point. If I fight them, these shia are going to come and they're, gonna, they're not going to allow it to happen. He understood that it was the, it was the people of Bid'ah that opened this door in the first place. Even when you look, the, the people who, who come and they attack the Muslims with regards to the, uh, the Qur'an. And they say the Qur'an is corrupted and not preserved. And Wallahi it's preserved and we can prove it time and time again. But these doubts and these arguments, who were the first to open them? The Shia. Not just the Shia. The Ash'aris. 
They open that Ash'aris open doubts with regards to hadith. You know now they come and they say hadith are fake and not authentic and da da da. It's because the Ash'aris don't accept hadith that are ahad, which is the majority of hadith. Singular narrations. They only accept hadith which are mutawatir, which is recurrent reporting. For example, a hadith, if only one companion narrated it, they won't accept they won't accept it in aqidah. But if ten companions narrated it, they accepted it. So the Ash'ara, which is the majority of Sufis, these Sufis, these Barelvis, these Ash'aris, they, they, they're either Ash'ari or Maturidi, it's the same thing. So most of these Sufis that you see, they have this belief that they don't take, they don't take Hadith Ahad in Aqidah. So when the Kuffar came and they started to say your Hadith are fake and fabricated and look at the weaknesses in your chain and Imam Zuhri, this, that, it's all lies. But when they make up these claims, who gave it to them? They read the books of the, the Ash'aris. When the Shi when they when the kuffar they attacked the Quran, whose books did they read? The Shia. Wallahi, if you read the books of the, the kuffar, they always quote in the Shia. They always quote in the, the people of Bidah. They're the ones who opened this door. So again, who opened the door on Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab to be attacked by the kuffar? It was these same people of Bidah. To the point where people now are scared of this term Wahhabi, even though we don't call ourselves Wahhabi, we're not Wahhabi. It's a it's a word that they gave to us. It's a word that they gave. In fact, it was a word given by British soldiers. They said. You effing Wahhabis. That's what they said. Because they were people who followed uh, the teachings of that which Sheikh Muhammad al Wahhab left behind. But he didn't leave behind anything new. He was just reviving what was already there. He was just reteaching what was already there. So these, so, so, so the imperialist, colonialist soldiers, they would say, you effing Wahhabis. So even the name they took from a swear word. And Wahhab <coughs> is one of Allah's names. So they ins essentially it's an insult to Allah's name. And they use that name against us. Why? Because Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab came at a time of extreme disunity. The Arabian Peninsula is one of the hardest places to unite. And the Prophet ﷺ managed to unite them. Despite the, the people are hard to unite. Because of their mind, their thinking, their, their structure, their terrain. It's too tribal. And not only that, the Prophet ﷺ united them. And then even though they had shirk, it was worse to unite. But he united them. But these people went back to their tribal ways. They went back to their little, you know... Sub tribes and sub tribes and sub tribes, and they were doing shirk. They were worshiping trees. They were worshiping graves. They were worshiping idols. They went back to this, the way of the Quraysh. In fact, the kufr of these people at the time was worse than the kufr of Quraysh, because the Quraysh, when they would disbelieve in Allah and do shirk, they would only do it in times of good. But in times of hardship, like Allah mentions, فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ دِينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ إِذَا هُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ That when they're in a ship and a storm comes, and the storm is about to take them, what do they do at that time when they know they're going to die? They don't call the idols, they call Allah. But these people today, these people today, the storm can come and they will still call the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They will still call Abdul Qadir Jalani. Our Shaykh Ustad Abdul Rahman, he mentioned one time he was on a plane, he was flying, uh, f within a flight in Yemen, in Somalia, and in Somalia, the planes are, don't they, they never at this time when he was studying it, they weren't the best quality planes. They were planes from back in the day, like World War II kind of time. So, as he's flying the plane, and there's a few people in the plane, the plane is like dipping and diving, and suddenly the plane starts to f fall through the air. The engine's not working. So, as the plane is starting to fall, he said, the, the, You know, everyone's saying, Ya Allah, help me, and there's a man who's a Sufi right next to him. And in the, in the flight, he, as the plane's falling, he says, Ya Abdul Qadir Jailani, who is a man that they worshipped. He's a man who's a saint who they worshipped. He says, Ya Abdul Qadir Jailani, save us, help us. And I remember he said, I became so angry at him. I said, you are the reason the plane is falling. So I threw him out of the plane. Of course, no one threw him out of the plane. He was just saying out of anger and frustration. But he was saying, SubhanAllah, if anything, you should jump. Like, take a parachute, jump out of the plane. Take a parachute, jump out of the plane. So... Because you're the reason why it's falling down, do you see? So these people, their kufr and shirk is worse. There's worse. So Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab came at this kind of a time. These people. And what did he do? He managed to unite them. He came to a place called Dhir'iyah with one of his students after being exiled from his land. The same way the Prophet was exiled from Medina, he was also exiled. And he came to Dhir'iyah. When he came to Dhir'iyah, the, the king, his name was Su'ud. Imam Su'ud. This is where the name Su'ud Arabia comes from. The leader, his name was Su'ud, his wife, his wife came to the leader and she said, an honorable man has entered into your city today. Give him victory. For if you give him victory, Allah will bring honor to us through him. And how did she know of him? Because her son and her husband's son used to study with Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. She said, he's a, so, 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 so Imam Su'ud said, okay, I'll call him to me. I'll tell the people to bring him to me. The woman, his wife, she said, no. 
He's a man of knowledge. He's a scholar. You go to him. See, when you have a righteous woman, she'll direct you in the right ways. So this leader of the people, he went. He went to Muhammad Abdul Wahab. He spoke with him. He said, Allah has brought you here. He says, I'm going to give you victory. I want you to teach the people. I want you to, because he realized Tawheed. Imam Saud realized Tawheed and Sunnah is what united the people before. And Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Wahab is teaching Tawheed and Sunnah. So he said, I want you to teach the people Tawheed and Sunnah. I will support you with my army. Anyone who harms you, my army will defend you. You just teach. You just teach, 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 teach. He got leadership and expansion. Muhammad Abdul Wahab got safety to teach. And he educated the people until shirk was eradicated. From the entirety of the Arabian Peninsula. They warded off the colonialists. They warded off all the enemies in that region. Until today, Saudi Arabia, with its deficiencies and its problems, still stands as one of the most beneficial Muslim countries to the entire world. Don't believe the propaganda that you hear. I'm not on no Saudi payroll. And I'm not blind to the problems that happen in the country. But I'm comparing it to the rest of the Muslim world. People get so excited about Turkey. <laughs> Have you been to Turkey? Have you seen what happens in Turkey? Have you seen the way the women walk, walk around in Turkey? Have you seen the way the men walk around? Have you seen the ship in Turkey? Just go, just go look in Turkey. Just go have a look. People get excited by the hype. So I, I am from Pakistan, and I love my people. And I tell you now, the Sunnah and Tawheed is not in Pakistan the way it is in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is one of the most beneficial countries to the Muslim world. Uh, the Burmese Muslims, they took the Burmese Muslims from Rohingya who've been killed. They brought them into Saudi Arabia and gave them citizenship. They don't give citizenship to nobody. They gave it to them. Did you hear that on the news? You never heard that on the news. Syria. They allowed Syrians and refugees in the tens of thousands to move into Saudi Arabia. Created whole camps for them. Well, if you just give a quick Google search, you'll be shocked to see the kind of refugee camps that they gave them. Proper huts and everything. And compared to the ones that these, the kuffar, they give them there. I'm not here to convince you Saudi Arabia is an amazing country or anything like that. To be honest, I really don't care what you think about Saudi. It's not, it doesn't mean nothing to me. Okay? That doesn't mean nothing to me. The thing is, you shouldn't criticize the rulers from any country that are Muslim rulers because the Prophet said told us we're not allowed to criticize the rulers because it creates more fitna and facade. Just like we saw in the, in the Arab Spring in North Africa, right? Each one of those countries in which the Arab Spring took place and they went against the leaders, if you go and ask the people in those countries, they say, we wish we never did that. You go into Egypt now, and you ask them about Sisi, and you say, Wallah, Hussein Mubarak was better. Hussein Mubarak was way better. And I'm not saying Hussein Mubarak was a good man. We all know him. But the point is that this was the wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu He told us not to go against our leaders, because it will create more corruption. Because the leader is not what the problem is. The problem is me and you. The problem is me and you. Allah said, كَذَلِكَ نُوَلِّي بَعْضُ الظَّالِمِينَ بَعْضُ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Allah said, like that, we placed oppressive leaders over them because of the way they were. So if you're an oppressive person yourself, you would have oppressive leaders on you. So change yourself because that leader will come out of one of these Muslim households, right? So the point is don't criticize the, the, the you know, not just Saudi Arabia, don't criticize the rulers in any country. But the point that I'm making to you is that Saudi Arabia still stands. They have an army. They have safety. They have security. They have wealth in terms of oil. They have what no other Muslim country has. And that's not because they're special for any other reason except that no idols are worshipped in Saudi Arabia. No one is worshipped except for Allah in Saudi Arabia. And the sunnah of the Prophet is more apparent there than any other country. And the moment they leave that, Allah will take all that away from them as well. We don't care. Whoever establishes Tawheed and sunnah, Allah will give them victory and strength. Hatta we say to the, to the, to the Christians and the, and the Kuffar here in England, we say, we, we, if you establish Tawheed and Sunnah here, Allah will make you the strongest country in the world. You don't have to worry about no Russians or nothing. Establish Tawheed and Sunnah here. And let's be British Muslims. Establish Tawheed and Sunnah here. And watch that which we just spoke about, all this glory that Allah gave to the Muslims. All those years ago, Allah will give it back to the British as here. This, this golden age of the British Empire and the British Raj they talk about, Wallahi Allah will give it to you better. You know, people, you know, you speak to the old English uncles and aunties, they always tell you, you know, yeah, we, we have the empire. Allah, Allah will give it back to you. Just stop worshipping Jesus. Stop being a mushrik. Allah will give it back to you. The point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala united when, 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 when Muhammad Abdul Wahab united the people upon Tawheed and Sunnah, Allah gave victory. That was an example in our not so recent history of its effects of which we can still see today of how Tawheed 
and Sunnah, which was combating Shirk and Bid'ah, was an example of the Muslims coming together, gaining strength, and we can still see elements of that strength today, even if it's not as strong as it once was. To show you, if you want what Saudi Arabia has, but better, then be better in eradicating Shirk and, to, uh, and establishing Tawheed and eradicating Bid'ah and establishing the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But definitely ignoring the problem and, and trying to unite, trying to unite, even though this disease and this cancer is still there, this cancer of Bid'ah is going to only cause the problem to exasperate further. And this is something <coughs> that the people of Bid'ah, they do. Because they want Bid'ah to spread. They want it to carry on. They want this corruption to be in the Ummah. So they turn away from the textual evidences that are right in front of them and the historical history that is right before them. And they turn towards what they do. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He guides us to the Tawheed and Sunnah and obedience and protects us from shirk bid'ah and disobedience. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik shadu la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.